you know, the scene that we played today here in Vienna, and we were very fortunate, I think, to, to shoot in, in uh, Berggasse, in uh, Freud's actual house. You know, he lived there from 1891 to 1938, so nearly 40 years, well, more than 40 years. And um, so those steps, those handrails, you know, that's, he's gone up and down those stairs many, many times. It was enjoyable to do that. It's about um, not so much, you know, how bright they were and, and what pioneers they were. It's about the mistakes they made, how, um, how imperfect they were. You know, that's where the passion is, that's where the emotion in the story is, and the humor. My name is Otto Gross, and uh, I'm actually um, a psychologist too, a pretty good one. But I'm really sick. I mean, I'm into drugs, and uh, I, have, I have a lot of uh, uh, different relationship with a bunch of women. I have kids all over the place, and uh, there's one line that really resumes what my character is all about. It's never repress anything, so he goes for whatever he feels like. I think Freud is uh, sending me to see Jung to challenge him. I'm supposed to be uh, cured by Jung, but at the end of the story, I wonder if, first of all, if I'm cured of anything. <laughs> and plus, I think eventually, the way Jung was thinking before he met Otto Gross was different. He's, he's, he's dark, he's mysterious, he's daring. Um, you know, I, I guess we are always a little bit attracted to, uh, to dark sides, you know, because it's forbidden, because it's, it's a little dangerous. You know, most of the time, we don't allow them ourselves to do things that are bad, even though we really want to, sometimes. The difference between Freud, Jung, and Otto Gross is that Otto Gross is actually, you know, doing, living his, uh, his method, you know, he goes for it with no, no returning back, you know, he, he's not scared. The idea of working with uh, Vigo and, and David again was something I, I couldn't refuse anyways. And uh, yeah, then the character is really, uh, he's very modern actually. It's, I can't really see him as a period character. He could have been, I don't know, the manager of the Rolling Stones in the 60s, you know? Well, the truth is that, yeah, you have directors like David, of course, that, you know, if they're asking me to do something, I, my first reaction would be to, to, to say yes. But then you have to read the script and see where you can fit and what you can do with the character. He doesn't talk much. If it's fine, he won't say anything. And if something is wrong, he will always come up with something very precise and short to make you understand what he's looking for. It's pretty universal matters, you know, what we're talking about. It's about sex, repression, um, uh, you know, trying to get rid of all the problems we had in our childhood, you know, things like that. And I think it's, it's very universal. So hopefully if things go well, I think people will get everything what we talk, that we're talking about. These people were incredibly intellectual and charismatic and articulate. They were also very passionate and their passion came through their articulation and their theories and their abstract thoughts and uh, really quite fascinating people and, um, and a fantastic story. It 
it was a a mentoring relationship. Uh, Jung thought of Freud as his father figure, and in fact called him that many times in letters and so on. Um, and so it was very intriguing to me to to come across um, a story about Freud and Jung that also involved a woman who, who until the 1970s was very uh, little known, uh, named Sabina Spielrein, Jewish-Russian woman who, who was a patient of Jung's, uh, with whom he had an affair, and then um, under his tutelage became uh, interested in psychoanalysis, and then ultimately became a Freudian analyst and went to Freud. So it was a strange menage a trois, uh, not that she had any sexual relationships with Freud, but, uh, but still there was love uh, in each part of the triangle, including between Jung and Freud. There was incredible um, uh, affection and, and a f a friendship between them. And Sabina was sort of in the middle of that. And Vigo is, you know, he's fearless. I mean, once he's committed to, to, do, a, uh, to do a role, there's nothing will stop him, you know, from, from doing it immaculately and, and with great depth. Stéphane Dupuis, who won an Oscar for my movie The Fly that many years ago and has worked with me many times, and every morning he would cook up a new nose for Vigo, a Freud nose. But it's incredibly subtle. It's not an exaggerated thing. It's just enough to make Vigo not quite be Vigo. And for an actor, that's a gift as well. It allows him to disconnect from him, himself, his own physiology, and to become another person. I really felt that Michael was a gift, you know, because once again, you need someone who, with that mustache, with the glasses, feels like Jung, as we know him from at least still photographs of the period, and his bearing, and his the, his use of language. And uh, Michael was, I, I think it's really a magnificent, beautifully subtle performance that will, well, you, you hope people will... will will recognize the, the range that, that, uh, that Michael has. She's incredibly well prepared, I mean immaculately well prepared, and you might think that someone who does that would be thrown by a sudden shift in exactly the way the scene is going to be shot and, and the, the dyna dynamics of the scene that you, instead of standing in the middle of a field speaking, uh, you're in a pond uh, with your hair wet, with mud all over you, that kind of thing. She she loved it. You know, she's just uh, such more than a trooper. I mean, she really it wasn't as though she did it dutifully. She did it with great exuberance, and uh, you can't buy that. You know, I mean, you you it just it just uh, an actor really has that to give you or does not, and she really does. I must say I had the same experience working with her that I had first with Vigo, which is that I knew that she was good, but I didn't realize that she was brilliant, and she is brilliant. I mean, she is a brilliant actress. She's as, as, as good as any actress I've ever worked with, and I have worked with some of the best actresses in the world. Otto Gross was a physician who was being trained by Freud, and Freud at first thought that Gross was the one to lead everyone into the future of psychoanalysis because he was considered really, in a way, the most brilliant of them all, even more brilliant even than Jung, maybe even than Freud. But of course he had a fatal flaw, which was in a way that he was a hippie. I wanted the movie to be sensual and beautiful as well as intellectually stimulating. It's also funny because they, these men and women had, they did have a sense of humor and they were, they were not, they were, they were not hesitant to use it uh, either on attack or just or for ego, uh, egotistical reasons and so on. There was a lot of sparring amongst these, this quartet of people. And, uh, and uh, it's a lot to deliver, but of course it was all there in Christopher Hampton's script, so up to the rest of us to, to realize it on screen.
a period piece for a costume designer is exciting and terrifying, you know, and especially once again when when there are many photographs of Freud and Jung uh, in the clothes that they would have worn um, at certain periods in their life um, to replicate that. And, and it is, it's a very subtle thing. I mean, my sister Denise uh, has worked with me many for many years uh, creating costumes for my movies. And but I don't think we've ever done we, na Naked Lunch in, in his own strange way was from the 1940s and 50s a period piece but we've never I think she's always wanted to do a, a massive period piece you know and, and this movie is that despite the fact that in some ways it's very uh, intimate I don't really know when I start making a film what the dynamics of it will be, uh, and what scenes will be will catch fire and be sort of the scenes that people remember. You just know that they're very um, juicy. You know, there's a lot of there's great texture, and these people are so interesting and intriguing, and their lives are so complex and 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 passionate that you just know that uh, along the way there's going to be you know sparks struck. Um, and so there are actually many scenes, I, I must say. I mean, I think this, the movie has many scenes that certainly delight me and surprise me. Um, and uh, it will surprise people who think they know something about Freud and Jung. Well, I mean, there's an enormous amount of dueling of dialogue and interesting dialogue in this film. And um, interesting, uh, the clash of ideas and that played by very, very good actors um, and directed by a wonderful director with a magnificent score. Together, to me, sort of could make a, um, a very, very tasty dish. Because every film has a lot of things going on. They've got the story, um, which is the story as you see uh, on the screen, the drama that happens, the simple drama that happens. And then there's a richness, a richness underneath, the sort of the iceberg underneath what you see, and there's a big iceberg on this film. You know. Human emotions in the, uh, of, uh, in, in, the, in the film. Human emotions that we all identify with and we see uh, and we enjoy on, on the television screen, but even in a soap you enjoy, you know, jealousy, love, distress, madness, um, becoming sane, uh, these these are, um, are elements that we like to watch. It's drama. So, you know, the dramatic side of the film, there's a drama in the film, strong dramatic, you know, not melodramatic, but dramatic. And also then a, a strong emotion in the film. So, you know, there has an emotion of the main characters have an emotion between them. Everybody, I think, felt stretched, fully stretched as actors and uh, involved with something, uh, you know, we're all unified in the idea that we were making a sort of special movie. David has become very, you know, he shoots essential, he shoots essential, and um, which is refreshing for actors as well who don't want to have to do 90 takes. Uh, and they like to, and you can feel the progression of a scene in a day and you can feel the drama progress within a day of shooting um, which I think also actors like very much. How it enhances um, David's film but again um, I'm sure that the, the challenge of David enhances Howard's music so I think you know it's something that works very very well for them both and I can't see David ever making a film without wanting Howard to do the score. Over the years, we've uh, refined our, our, our work and, and, and how we uh, uh, make decisions. And uh, the, the collaboration is very intuitive. And uh, we've known each other a long time. So I think as David is uh, making his films in a very precise way, I'm also uh, you know, through the experience I've had in, in making films, also trying to match my experience to his and, and uh, compose music that also has the precision 
and the detail that he's put into the film. I want to delve into the story through the writings and I want to be inspired by the, the story uh, emotionally and also intellectually. And then I put everything aside and I start to uh, react uh, really just as a viewer, how I feel about certain characters, how I feel about uh, the colors of the film, that's very important to me, the actors, the, the sense of movement, the way that Ron Sanders edits the film, Peter Shisitsky's cinematography, Denise Cronenberg's uh, costume design, all very important to me uh, as a composer, how I react to the film and how I write and how I then uh, use the colors in the orchestration to create the world of a dangerous method. I like to work around the edges of the drama and I like to let the scenes unfold on screen in a, na a natural way. And with music and composition, you can bring out the subtext of the story. You can uh, d discuss things in the music uh, that not necessarily are on, on the screen.
Let's do it. Let's not wait for the cars. Yeah. Let's go. All right, let's go. Ready? And action. Background action. Be the truth. And I can assure you that in a hundred years' time, our work will still be rejected. Background action. I don't think you have any notion of the true strengths and depths of the opposition to our work. There's the whole medical establishment, of course, baying to send Freud to the auto de fe. never have sent calls to you. I blame myself. But I'm very grateful you did. All those provocative discussions helped crystallize a lot of my thinking. Hmm. Did he really send you his hotel bill? Only for a couple of nights. He's an addict. I see that now. He can only end by doing great harm to our movement. You realize this makes you undisputed crown prince, don't you? My son and heir. I'm not sure I deserve such an accolade. Don't say another word. My son and heir. I'm not sure I deserve such an accolade. Don't say another word. I often take my walk up here. It's inspired some of my best ideas. That was beautiful. <laughs> Did I uh, block myself with a cigar, David? I often take my walk up here. It's inspired some of my best ideas. Absolutely no objection to your studying telepathy or parapsychology to your heart's content. Action. Our own field is so embattled that it can only be dangerous to stray into any kind of mysticism. Don't you see? We have to stay within the most rigorously scientific confines. Don't you see, we have to stay within the most rigorously scientific confines. You all right? Yes. My young friend, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. You must promise me. You see? <laughs> but that's just, you really can't be serious. There are so many mysteries. You mustn't think I have a closed mind. I have. Absolutely no objection to your studying telepathy or parapsychology to your heart's content. Thank you. 
Good. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Good. Good. All right. 35. Mm-hmm. Attack on you as soon as you bring up the question. So I think there's quite an interesting, I don't know, I'm just listening to it. Yes. Start as you mean to go on. <laughs> nice thing. But the, the individual always has to overcome a resistance because of the self annihilating nature of the sexual act. Mm. I fought against the idea for some time. But I suppose there must be some kind of indissoluble link between sex and death. This is why you are the way you are. He, he wants to be able to say, we can show you what it is you might want to become. Playing God. <laughs>